Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Hudak Confessional. It is the show where we're going to talk New Orleans Saints football for the next couple hours. We got several guests lined up. I've got our friend, of course, Brian Bienemy, who will be joining us shortly, as well as people from a couple other nice places. Now, don't get too upset. I realize that Sunday's game was a, a tough loss, to say the least. I was there. I witnessed it firsthand. Everybody loves to go to a Saints game and watch them lose and hear the fans jeer you as you're trying to walk out the stadium, but it's all right. There is hope on the horizon, even if that horizon is a little bit farther off than some of us might like to admit. (laughs) But we'll be talking about that tonight, getting into it and getting into some of the player performances, getting to the last week's game, looking ahead, seeing what we got to do with Tampa. And as well, we're not just going to handle that. We are going to take care of what I believe needs to be talked about. This Brandon Cooks thing has gotten a little bit out of proportion. Uh, We've, of course, got Will Smith's murder trial going on. Not his murder trial, obviously, but his passing. And then we've got, it looks like Brian has just ringed in. How you doing, Brian? Just giving them the, the heads up of where we're going tonight. I'm doing well, my brother. How are you? Um. I'm all right, man. Uh, I tell you, it wasn't the best weekend for me. I decided to go to my first Pels game. We played the Clippers. I probably should have planned that out better. And then the game that we should have won against the Lions, we came out and fell flat like it was the New York game all over again. Uh, Yes. Pels, extremely disappointing effort versus the Clippers. And, of course, the Saints, there's really no words you can use to describe what that was on Sunday because I won't even say it was a lackluster effort because effort was nowhere in the building on the part of the Saints. You know, it's tough for me because I'm one of those rare diehards. I know everybody thinks, well, not everybody, obviously, but some people think that maybe I don't love the team as much as others, but I was the one of the few people, I think the only one in my section, who stayed through that entire painful game to watch Drew throw that last second interception as they try to desperately claw for to keep his home touchdown streak alive there's really no reason for them to keep fighting like that but they did and man that was i can't even say it's tough to watch because that's not putting it in enough you know emphasis on the tough that that was a horrible game for so many different reasons i mean it it almost seemed as if what you and i talked about prior to on last week's show the letdown, you know, you know, uh, we spoke of it. The Saints have mm-hmm. to prove after that emotional win versus the Rams that they could, you know, they can come out and handle success, and that was one of the things I was afraid of. But yeah, I mean, you know, I still thought the Saints would, you know, find some kind of way to pull out the victory. You know, that maybe they they had learned something from early in the season, but apparently, the Saints are basically a college team right now. And the fact that you know it's kind of hard for a college team, a group of young guys. Well, let's say Alabama versus LSU. It's hard for those two teams after playing such an emotional game to go and play a team like, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Arkansas State or something like that. And you really expect for them to just blow that team out and play well. It's like it's kind of hard because it's not the same level of, of energy that you're using, you know, in a game. But man, I, I can't tell you enough on how disappointed I was in, in the way the Saints played. Well, for the few of you who might be out there listening who did not get to witness the game, you can take my word for it that it was horrible. The Saints fell 28-13. to 13. Uh, Drew Brees threw no touchdown passes. I know that's a rare thing to say in the 10 years he's been with us, but three interceptions, some of those pretty critical interceptions. Run game really never had a chance to take off. Ingram looked good his first couple carries, and he re-aggravated that toe. He did come back, though, for all those pundits who like to come in Ingram for not being tough enough. He ended up having over five yards of carry, but the entire team only rushed the ball 12 times. Uh, I mean, they got down quick and in a hurry and just couldn't find any form of rhythm. Last week, you know, Peyton came out on fire, his first full game to take complete control of the offense was last week. He pro- he has his hand definitely in every play call, every game plan, all year long, no matter who we're playing. But his first time to have 100% control. And then this past Sunday was the second game he had decided to do that. And I forgot who the user was or else I'd give him credit for. But as soon as it got announced that he would do that against 
the Lions, one of my Twitter followers, would just expect, you know, 400-something screens. And that's what we got. We got a bunch of bubble screens to the wide receivers, a bunch of running back screens. And and sometimes that's fine, but I don't know, you know, if you paid attention or got to see, but the Lions ran a predominant zone defense basically all game long. And you just don't run screens against zone defense because they're always going to have those corners or always going to have those linebackers staying in the second level. You just don't try to force that against screens. But we we did that all game long. And, And it goes back to that problem that we talked about last week that we've talked about several times on this show. It's not only Peyton's arrogance on that he won't adjust, is that it's almost like he can't anymore because we got so hyped about his revenge game. And then it's like we're back to seeing the same Sean Payton we've seen since he's returned from the scandal that we all know exists. You know, and, and, and that's what's getting at me because this team is better than they showed Sunday. I'm not saying the Lions aren't a good team. They're a division leader. And one of the things I made sure to point out last week on the show is that they find a way to win. You're not going to look at the scorecard and the box score and just be, like, amazed by the Lions team. They don't have any real names that are just going to come out and shock you in terms of star power. There, there's no Brady's. There's no Gronk's. There's no Aqib Tlaib's. There's no C.J. Smith's. None of that. But they find ways to win, and they, they certainly found a way to do it against New Orleans. It, it's almost as if the teams were, were, were reversed for a minute. Because the Detroit Lions played much like I thought the Saints would play. Mm-hmm. Hand the ball off to Ingram, gritty team, wear Detroit down. I understand Detroit doesn't have the, the like you said, the, the names on defense, but I was I was more disappointed in the fact that the Saints kind of kept ramming their head against the wall and he didn't realize it was hurting. Number number one, number one thing that came out to me is that it seemed as if Detroit had about five or six batted passes at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, if that's the case. Move Drew Brees, quit leaving him directly in the middle of the pocket. Roll him out a little bit, change his launching point, because Haloti Nada was eating Max Unger's lunch and wasn't even thinking about how, you know, how Max felt about it. The entire O-line as a unit didn't play as well as we've seen them play over the past few games. I mean, maybe half the season, but it just seems as if Sean Payton didn't care. He was hell-bent on saying, this is how we're going to beat Detroit, and I don't care what else is working. This is what we're going to do. I know we're going to get into the big, you know, reason why a lot of people believe that game went the way it went offensively. But yeah, it, it just seems as if like you know, he was he had a plan. He was sticking to it, no matter what the outcome was going to be. Well, say on offense, I still have to go back and rewatch the game from an offensive standpoint. I've already rewatched it to to watch the defense. Offense, I mean. What shocks me, and I'm going to give credit to the Lions defense and their coaching staff because they ran some things a little differently, but for the Saints to have come out against the Rams defensive line, which most people will consider the best in the NFL, or there will be an argument, they're in the argument for best in the NFL, the Rams are, and they're certainly a better overall defense than the Lions are, yet the Lions got much more consistent pressure. They got to Drew Brees a lot more quicker and a lot of the routes that we tried to run just simply had no time to develop you know and you're not going to see a lot of success when you fail to adjust to what the team is doing and something that made Sean so good in his first six years with New Orleans is he would adjust I remember in the Super Bowl game and it's something that the defense talked about Greg Williams talked about Sean's talked about that they came out with game plans per quarter for what they were going to do. They came out with scripted 15, you know, first 15 plays were scripted for so long. And then they adjusted based on that. And it's like the Saints have lost the ability to do that, you know, because it's not just Ingram. I understood, you know, you got down a little quick, but it's, the Saints weren't trailing by a ton at halftime or anything. It was a 13-6 to 6 game, you know. So they, they could have still focused on running the ball. Ingram gets hurt, fine. Tim Hightower has shown and earned the right to you know be able to pick that up. Tim Hightower had two carries all game long. And I know people are going to be shocked that I'm calling for Hightower to have gotten more touches. But when your running backs, your main two running backs between Ingram and Hightower have nine carries the entire game, and you're not exactly down. We weren't down 20 points or anything. This was a close game until we started letting it slip away in the second half. And it reminds me so much of that Giants game. 
you know, we kept trying pass, pass, pass when Detroit said, we'll let you run the ball. You saw Ingram get a 22-yard scamper on a broke toe, basically. But we just kept trying to, you know, play pass. And to the Lions' credit, they made some incredible plays to get a couple of those interceptions. You know, and I know everybody wanting to talk about the Brandon Cooks <laughs> drama. But a lot of those, specifically one of the Brandon Cooks' interception was just an incredible play by the Lions but they are playing past the whole way. And I think when a team is doing that, you have to take what a team is giving you. If they're letting you run, run. It doesn't matter if Ingram's hurt. I, you know, everybody knows I don't believe Hightower is as good of a back, but he deserves more than two carries. If, if your main guy goes down, it's a next man up mentality, not change our plan. You know what I'm saying? I totally agree with that. And what bothers me more than anything else is, you know, and it was twofold when it comes to the offense. The first would be is that the Saints offense seems as if they're giving teams a head start. Because before you know it, you, you know, you're fumbling, you're turning the ball over, you're doing a quick three and out, and you're putting the defense in a bad position because you have to defend the short field, and every single time it's happened, the opposing team has cashed in. The second thing that bothered me the most is the Saints refuse to take advantage in what seems to me as ill. Every other snap, a Lions player was on the ground leaving the game. I'm like, I, I don't understand what happened, especially defensively. It mm-hmm. seems as if they lost three or four guys that were key pieces to their defense. Peyton refused to, to make the adjustments that you were speaking of just now. Yes, again, Mark Ingram got hurt, okay? Still, you, I, I just I, I refuse to believe during the week. Sean Payton said, we're going to try to run the ball X amount of times at Detroit. I refuse to believe it. I, it almost reminds me of the times when Sean Payton would play teams like Baltimore and Pittsburgh, and it was almost as if two things were being said. Number one, everyone in the media would say, you can't throw the ball on that team, and Sean Payton would say, oh, really? Watch me. And then yeah. there was another part of me that believed that Sean, you know, it, it, was, it was the arrogance of, I don't need to throw the ball. I don't need to run the ball. I got Drew Brees. And that is what I can't understand because Mark Ingram over the past three or four weeks has been on an absolute tear since he came back from the bench. Why yeah. not take advantage of angry Mark Ingram? Because that's a heck of a back. Yeah, and, and look, I understand because I'm sure there's several people listening who will, they should call him, but I, for whatever reason, sometimes they don't. But they're going to you know, argue with you that Ingram is obviously not better than Breeze in terms of, of ability and power. And I agree with them, but you also – you put Breeze in a real tough spot when all they have to do is rush three, rush four, and they didn't have to do a lot of blitzes. Uh, Drew Breeze, uh, pro football focus, pulled the numbers on terms of how he did under pressure, and, and Breeze did very well against the blitz, which is what he normally does. I think he had like a 95 rating. It's not amazing, but it's good. But in terms of just being under pressure, about being rushed by four players, he had – well below his average. I'll pull up the exact number so that I'm not just pulling numbers for everybody. And they were able to get that pressure off both edges. Both Andres Pete and Zach Streif had very tough games on the edge. And when Breeze is under that type of pressure, you have to find something to get it away from him. And whether that's going to be draw plays to Hightower or Ingram, or whether that's going to be quick slants, why is it that the Saints, in terms of the receiving core and even the running backs for the most part now are designed like a West coast offense. If anybody watched a lot of late eighties games and early nineties with, you know, like the 49ers who made it famous, this team has the size, speed and ability to run a West coast style. So you can run plenty of these draw plays and slants, you know, and, um, ins and outs out of the backfield with Ingram and Hightower who have both shown that they can receive pretty well. You can run these curl routes. You can you know, run these little screens if you have to. Why is like Michael Thomas not getting the slant on third and one? Instead, we try to run up the middle with Tim Hightower. And I think that was the second drive of the game. Stuff like that that just doesn't give your team a lot of chance for success. Use what you have that you're strong at at the forefront of your game. Don't try to be cute and fancy and make something happen that you think is going to confuse an opponent. You know what I mean? Peyton wouldn't be Sean Payton if that was the case. Well, yeah, that's a whole nother gripe. And maybe everybody now, everybody kind of hushed up for a little bit this year. 
but I've said it. I mean, you can verify for me if anybody ever asked, but I've said for a couple of years that Sean Payton's days need to be up in New Orleans. Not that he has no talent, not that he's not one of the best offensive minds in the NFL today, bar none, but simply from the argument and standpoint that there is a reason an NFL coach 